Welcome everybody to the Sailing Science Center podcast. And today we are lucky enough to have Charlie Walther with us. Charlie Walther got his BS in marine engineering from Cal Maritime in 1967. He was the first in his class and he's been working as a marine engineer ever since. He spent 23 years working for Crowley Maritime, doing everything from pumping bilges and working his way up to the director of engineering and machinery for five years. He left there 33 years ago to start his own business, Walther Engineering, and has been very involved in the San Francisco Ferry Fleet, in particular, the greenification of the San Francisco Ferry Fleet, which is what we're speaking to him today about. So, Charlie, welcome. And I just want to say it's really a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you. It's nice to be here. And we'll just uh, we'll just jump right in. 1967, I was alive then, but not all of our listeners were. Let's go back, roll back before 1967 and ask you, how did you get interested in the maritime industry? I was born in Los Altos, and when I was 10, moved up near Redding to a ranch. And one of my best friend's brother attended the Maritime Academy when I was in high school. He went to college there in Vallejo. And it, it filled a need for me. It had all the things I wanted, engineering, very good engineering program. And then I found I really loved the ocean and the sea. So it fit quite nicely. How did you discover that you loved the ocean and sea? Were you a recreational boater or did you, what experiences did you have that, that led you to that? We lived on a creek. <laughs> That's all the water. <laughs> it was near Lake, Lake Shasta, but I really had no experience until I came to the academy. Okay. And so this was something that was mostly inspired by the friend of yours. Yeah. Okay. And how large was Cal Maritime at that time? Was it a, a pretty good sized school? It's about a third of what it is now. There were mm -hmm. 275 cadets, I believe, somewhere in that range. Okay. There were 75 graduated in my class. Okay. And as, as we mentioned, you were top of your class, which is admirable and I think worth worth mentioning. So coming out of Cal Maritime in 1967, computers existed. I know just to date myself, that was about 10 years before I got out of college. And at, when I got out, we were just starting to use computers to do technical drawing. So I guess in 1967, maybe some people had thought of about that. What what was it like being a marine engineer in, in 1967? I still have my original pencil and T-square set and computers were mainframes and they used punch cards. So they're really, when you think of a computer today, you think of a laptop or a desktop, generally speaking, but there were, those did not exist until 1983, 84. Apple would argue with that. They started a little earlier and, and did a really good job, but we didn't really have computers per se. So it was pencil and paper, and uh, we didn't even have calculators. It had slide rules, if you could imagine that. I, I can, actually. <laughs> I hate to admit it, but I was a, in, in grade school, I carried a slide rule around. I bought one in an antique store out in Bodega Bay a few years ago, and it's beautiful ebony and ivory and leather case. And I said, uh, how much do you want for this thing? And he says, I don't know. How much will you give me? I said, $2. He says, okay. Yeah. So then he said, what is it? And it's just a beautiful <laughs> slide roll, the nicest one I've ever seen. So How yeah, times that? have changed. Yeah, times have changed. And I'll just throw this in. My dad was an engineer. And so he had a beautiful mahogany slide roll that I ultimately inherited. And he also had a slide rule tie clip that actually worked. Um, it wasn't very, it wasn't very precise, but you could actually use it to do multiplication and division. So our listeners who haven't seen a slide rule ever used a slide rule, this might be a little history that you can look up and how we did things before computers. So that's great. And you've been integrally involved in the design and construction of San Francisco's ferry fleet. Tell us about your goals in that role and what your bigger challenges. Have. I started out in 1983 as a project manager on a ferry, a high-speed ferry, the first high-speed ferry on the West Coast to go to Vallejo from San Francisco. And we had some serious issues with it. And the first one being speed and power. 
which is still the basic issue with every ferry boat of speed. And, and it was, it didn't have enough horsepower to make the run. So the engine maker just put more fuel in it and took more horsepower out of it. Well, it didn't work. It uh, kept breaking down. In fact, it only ran 500 hours, which is a month on the first engines. And so over the years, we've changed, made the ferry longer, put more power in it. And in that particular boat, it's still operating in New York City. Hornblower bought it. But it started out with uh, 1,100 horsepower, and now it's up at about 1,800 per side. And still moving along, I've managed the construction, design and construction of about 20 boats in the bay. And, and that the power to weight ratio is, is still the, the big driver. And what, what qualifies as a high speed ferry? What would be the, the cutoff that you would, qual- you would call it a high speed ferry? Generally, it's about 28 knots, 28 to 30, depending on where, where you are, 27, somewhere in there. The Coast Guard and- has a rule, a high speed craft rule that come, kicks in at some point, but it's in that range. Okay. And then there are there equipment carriage requirements at that point that for those vessels? Okay. They're, they're the boats that we have here on the Bay are subchapter T or subchapter K boats from Coast Guard rules. Most of them are Ks. If I remember correctly, that's 400 plus passengers? 150. 100. 149 is T and 150 is K plus. 150. Okay. Okay. And so in these, the high speed ferries, are those typically catamarans or are some yes. of those, okay, are any, are there any monohull high speed vessels? Not here. There were a few in Seattle for a short time. They were Gulf, Gulf boats from the Gulf of Mexico mm-hmm. and they were doing 21, 22 knots, which isn't okay. fast enough for most of our routes. Like Vallejo's. 30 mi- 26 miles from San Francisco. And if you do 26 knots, it takes an hour. If you do 22, it's just too long. So most of the boats, the Vallejo boats, the North Bay boats run at 32, 36 knots. And, and then the Mid Bay boats, I'll call them now, Central Bay, are running at 26, 27, somewhere in there. And that's at full power, full continuous horsepower for the engine. Going on to some a little bit more <laughs> historical note here. In, in 2010, I took a group of people to see the USS Hornet aircraft carrier. And I was astonished to learn that ship was built, it was constructed in less than a year. Now, of course, that was during wartime, but I don't see where we could even come close to even getting plans approved in that length of time today. How do you see how technology And computers have changed the boat building business and just not only construction, but design and everything else. How have you seen that evolve? In the first place, there's a, I'm always reminded when you tell that story, there's one in Sausalito, the the ship, they built ships there. And Bechtel got a contract in March 23rd, I believe it was, of of 1942, I believe, to build a shipyard and ships. And in that year, they delivered five tankers. They built a shipyard and delivered five tankers. Can we do that today? Not even close. You couldn't even, yeah, you couldn't even finish the plans. No, you could probably finish the plans because of computers. And that's where software computers design is uh, so much better, is so much better than paper that if you just said you could take parts of, you need this building, this building, you need machinery, you could do that whole plan and probably in that eight months before you even started anything else. It's just a lot more complex and the the vessels are more complex, but still that what you just told us is just remarkable. Yeah. If you see the Hornet and and I thought I looked at the engine room and I said, I don't see how you could even build the engine room in a year, but I get the engine in a year. Yeah. And that there wasn't the regard for environmental regulation and stuff like that, because it was wartime and maybe you had to put a lot of bureaucracy aside. But I found that to be one of the most astonishing facts that I've ever heard. No, I agree. Yeah, it's really impressive. So sail power is something that's interesting. And one of the things that 
I know you for is having been the engineering coordinator on the Matthew Turner. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the Matthew Turner and, and what the Matthew Turner is. Not all of our listeners will know what it is. So maybe you can talk about the Matthew Turner and your involvement in that and how you and the team worked to make that a showcase, if you will, for green engineering on the water. She's a sailing ship that is a, a replica, not exact replica, but close to a, a ship that Matt, the Galilee that Matthew Turner designed and built in 1872, I believe it was. That, but the purpose of this ship is for the edu- it's educational tall ship is what she's the organization is call of the sea. <clears throat> and uh, Matthew Turner was built by volunteers in Sausalito. She's 135 feet long, give or take a foot, depending on how you measure. And uh, two masts, 100 feet tall, 13 sails. And I got involved in the very, almost the very beginning. They asked if they asked me a question about the propeller shafts. And so we talked about that and then went farther and then said, oh, we're going to put a hybrid plant in it. And so I got involved with that process and we selected, and Hornblower had a couple of hybrids at that point. So what is a hybrid? It uses a diesel engine or in a car, in case, think of a Prius. It has a gasoline engine and then a battery set, big batteries, bigger than a, just a starter battery and electric motor. So the engine has a generator that drives, makes electricity go into the batteries and then the batteries go into the motor. And so that's what they wanted to do. They wanted the Matthew Turner to be the greenest ship ever. And I think she is because we got the hybrid plants. There's two bus systems that came. They were designed by British Aerospace, BAE. And at that point, they had built 6,000 buses with that exact same system. So we marinized it, designed the piping and cooling and all the things we had to do to make it marine and, and built it. And she's working now, but she can, she can uh, go under diesel power, which I don't want to say diesel because we're using renewable fuel, which is a whole other subject, but it's, the, it's uh, plant-based oils that go through the same process, hydrocracking process that fossil fuel, black oil does to make renewable fuel. It's, it's exactly the same as diesel fuel, except it's even clear, more clear. And so we can get underway with the renewable fuel in the diesel engines and then set sail and sail for however we want and go wherever you want. She could basically go to Tahiti with no problem, which is what the Galilee that Matthew Turner designed originally did. <clears throat> and then while you're underway with sails, the propellers are turning, but they're generating electricity and filling up the battery again. And uh, then you come back to the dock and you still have battery power for lights and mooring and things like that. Say a little bit more about electricity generation using the propellers. How much, how much of a speed penalty is that to the boat when it's under sail? Insignificant, really. But if you're in a sailboat race with another boat, sailboat that doesn't have that, then you'd have a penalty unless okay. they let you use that electricity later on to cross the finish line. But by insignificant, we're talking tenths of a knot or less than tenths of a knot? Yes, yes. And the, another way to look at it is how much electricity do we generate from the propeller? And it's only about 10 kilowatts, eight or 10 kilowatts, where they'll produce per side and, and it'll produce... It takes 200 kilowatts to go 10 knots with the motors when you're motoring. And so in regenerating, you only get eight, well, you get what, 5% back because the propeller is not efficient in that reverse mode. They could change propellers and do better, but it's not at that point. No, we're not there yet. And I've been out on the, the Matthew Turner now several times, and I'm not sure that I was even aware of when we were maneuvering in close quarters, when we were leaving and returning to the dock, if the diesel engines were running or if it was strictly electric, do you know how, how the vessel is normally operated in close quarters like that? Yeah, usually they would leave and arrive with battery power. Okay, and that the diesels would only be used in if there was a need to recharge the batteries, is that Correct. right? Correct. 
Okay. So most of the time they would stay plugged in like your plug-in Prius. No, she doesn't have a plug-in arrangement. It's only diesel power to, ch- to do run the generators at this or renewable and renewable fuel power. So they're not using shore power to keep the, the batteries topped off? No. Oh, interesting. It is because uh, they have a big solar panel on top of the BAVE model. And so they have basically free electricity, but the, the cost to do that is uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars because of the system. You know, it'd be when you plug in your Prius, it's, it comes with the car. In this case, it's a expensive add on. Okay. And so the, the, the vessel is on her own power systems then at all times? No, we have a shore power. We have shore power when she's at the dock. And when you pull the plug, you don't have shore power anymore. And so then it uses the batteries. But the battery power came from either this regeneration from the sails or from the renewable fuel engine. Okay. Very interesting. Okay. So that's something I didn't know about that vessel. So when we talk about green marine and creating greener (laughs) vessels, what are the limiting factors and what areas do you think are most important in, you know, what we call green marine air quotes there for people who are just listening? What are the limiting factors in green marine going forward and how do we get greener? I think the batteries are the are the really the limiting factor because they're they have much more power than than your flashlight batteries or your car battery, but per weight per unit of weight. If you look at hand tools, they've gone to lithium ion batteries as most vessels have, and cars and Prius they're mostly lithium ion batteries for some metal hydride battery, not a lead acid. And so like a Tesla's carrying around a ton of batteries, significant weight of batteries. <clears throat> and in a, in a think of an airplane, that isn't going to work. <clears throat> but they've made good enough improvements in battery technology that there are some battery-powered aircraft. And uh, so the battery is the key, the weight and the size of the batteries. And that's changing pretty fast. Are these advances in battery technology, are they evolutionary or revolutionary? Is there something better than lithium ion on the horizon or it, are we just making lithium ion better no i think i, I don't know exactly to, how to answer that other than that there are some new technologies coming out but slowly so it's evolutionary and the other important thing here is how do you make well the next step is hydrogen how do you make hydrogen right now hydrogen's available because they use it for hydro cracking in the refineries for fuel And that's really called, there's green, blue, and brown energy from where do you get it? The source. And so blue hydrogen is made from electrolysis from using solar or wind or wave energy. You're not using fossil fuel to make that. The brown energy comes from, hydrogen comes from gas, natural gas. And then the other comes from the the cracking of the fuels, fossil fuels. So to make a green energy, you can use plant-based uh, oils and, and then take that energy and, and make heat and make the electrolysis to get the hydrogen out of water. But the, be- the cleanest way, the quickest way is photo and, and wind power, solar and wind power. And then this hydrogen would be used in fuel cells? Is that... uh, Yeah, it could be used in fuel cells or diesel engines or gasoline engines, rather, will run on hydrogen fuel. And uh, and there's some reciprocating engines can burn, reciprocating and turbines can burn pure hydrogen, as do fuel cells. Fuel cells are more efficient than either mechanical engines. So when I think of hydrogen, the first thing that comes to mind is the Hindenburg, as I'm sure for some people... I'm not old enough to remember that, but I... <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty dramatic. So what, how do we feel about the safety of hydrogen? And in, in marine or maritime use, we don't have the same issues so much of collisions like you might have with a car on the road, but you do have issues of corrosion. So if you were storing hydrogen in a pressure vessel or something like that, that could be a risk. So how do we feel about our safety comfort level working with hydrogen? First of all, the Hindenburg, if you look carefully at the 
that the video of that ex people say an ex explosion, but it wasn't, it was a fire. And hydrogen is the lightest element in the universe. And it will, since it's so light and we have gravity on earth, if you took a cup of hydrogen that you made with your electrolyzer and opened it up, it would be out of our atmosphere. It's 60 miles an hour is how fast it goes up. It's that light. So uh, you look at the Hindenburg next time and just watch the flames. They just go up. They don't go down. They didn't explode. It's a fire. And so that's one thing. Another thing is we're soon to take delivery of a hydrogen power, hydrogen fuel cell powered ferry boat here in the Bay. <clears throat> and by soon it's finished now and they're doing the final electrical alignment of systems, software stuff. <clears throat> and that has tanks on the roof, on the top of the ferry. Okay. So that if any, there's any leakage, it goes straight up very fast. That's a great answer because I know as a boater and somebody who lives on his boat, that one of the concerns I have is that we cook with propane and, and propane has the opposite problem. It's much heavier than air. So it stays inside the boat and it sinks to the bottom. So ventilating that out is, can be a challenge. And you know, what you're saying about the hydrogen, that, that makes a lot of sense, right? If you keep the tanks up high, then it just becomes a, a non-issue. There are hydrogen cars driving. I see them all the time in Marin. There's a station in Mill Valley right on the freeway. And you just drive your hydrogen car in there, plug the hose in and fill it up and off you go. So it's, you, ha it, you have to take precautions, but it's not, and they've been doing this for five or six years now. California has a big project to build more hyd hydrogen stations. Very interesting, Charlie. This is, I only just know very peripherally about a lot of these things. Going back to the the marine industry and your education at Cal Maritime, I'm understanding that there are projections of pretty major worker shortages in the marine ind industry going into the, the next decade. What kinds of things can we do to solve or mitigate those problems? Education and training of people. And so we're talking about getting more people to go to Cal Maritime. How do we do that? That's one thing. Uh, but another part is people, you could ask almost anybody around you're in the Bay Area, what do you think of Cal Maritime? And they go, what's that? They never heard of it. It's amazing. And, and I don't know why that is, because it's, they have the distinction of having the, at, at five years, they have the highest graduation amount in the CSU system. And in five years, they have the highest pay of any one of the CSU. I think there's 23 colleges. So, you know, the opportunity's there and it's only going to get better. And the education there is amazing. They're working on hydrogen projects right now. That's stupid. And mechanical drawing, I went up there recently and they had a, the final exam, if you will, for a class. It was a design class and they had to design an electric motor. And then they had to draw it up. And then they have uh, computer printers, 3D printers. They had to print the, the pieces for it and then wire it up and then test it. And they got graded on how the test went with their particular motor. And, and they had a fan and a wind tunnel and they were measuring the airspeed and so forth. But to see that what these kids had done in design, first they had to design a, an electric motor and then build it and then test it and then graph the results. And it's, uh, it's phenomenal what they're accomplishing. So if the Sailing Science Center was going to play a role in helping to funnel people in that direction, what would you see as the best way for us in the Sailing Science Center to help do that? That's a good question, but they, the Academy also has a very, and for many years, has had a very advanced sailing program, competitive sailing program, in addition to the, the educational part. Maybe you have a race. They love and, racing. I, and I have to throw in here as a hundred ton captain myself and have done, this is very anecdotal and maybe not statistically significant, but I ask a lot of people who are in the maritime industry, how did you get in? And it's the vast majority, it's by being involved recreationally 
mm-hmm. on on boats at an early age, either power boaters or sailboats, and finding that love of the water and wanting to spend more time around it. And it was interesting, and your experience came a little bit more indirectly than that, but I find a, an awful lot of the captains I've worked with, on the weekends, they're fishing or they're doing something on the water. Yeah, my friend that got me involved and I, we lived on cattle ranches and and orchards and had a lot of work to do there. And so we went there to get away from that. <laughs> it's, it's as much what you don't do. So as we're recording this, it's the month of March and March is Women's History Month. And typically women have been underrepresented in the maritime industry. What have you seen in your career in trends in that direction? And how do you see it progressing in the future? When I went to the academy, there were no women other than in the office. None. Zero. Zero. And it was maybe 15 more years before they had one or two. And now there's 25%, 23% or something are women. And I met and, and worked for a woman on the, the WIDA ferries, Water Emergency Transit, and they now have 20-some boats here in the bay. And she was an engineer. She was the first, the first, she and a pilot here in San Francisco, Nancy Wagner, were the first two mm-hmm. women to attend the United States Maritime Academy in New York in, in the first class for women. And she went on to sail on ships and then got her chief engineer's license. I think she's the first woman chief engineer certified in the world. And then she went to work for the Water Transit Authority. And I worked for her as a consultant to do the design and construction management. By the time we were done, we did six or eight, no, 10 boats, 10 ferries. And, uh, and that was, I stopped doing this about five years ago for WIDA. But uh, they, there are now four women captains on those boats. There's, if you look at some of the ads on TV for Ex, one of the cruise lines, there's a woman captain that graduated from Cal Maritime on the biggest cruise line there is, Schleiner. And so it's it's slowly changing. There's a lot of women lawyers now that have gone through marine and then law. So it's definitely changing. And Nancy Wagner, that name, uh, is or was she a bar pilot? She was, yeah. For a number of years. Was she the first uh, San Francisco, yes. female San Francisco bar pilot that seemed to ring a bell with me? It was, uh, there's a funny story about that I love to tell is Nancy is a very petite, and beautiful woman. And she went on and she had her big red float coat and her radio and stuff. And she went off the pilot boat up maybe 10 miles outside the Golden Gate Bridge up onto this Japanese container ship coming in. And so she introduced herself as they do and said, what's your course? Where are we headed? Blah, blah, blah. And through all that. And then the, she could see the Japanese captain pacing back and forth from one side of the bridge to the other. And finally he came up and he said, Mrs. Pilot, where is Mr. Pilot? And she said, that's me, like it or not. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's, but there are some other women pilots here in other places now. So the trend is positive. And well, I think, if you're a woman, yes. Yeah. It's, it's, but it meets with some resistance from the male side, of course, like everywhere else. And yeah, what, what do we do about that? Or is it necessary for us to do more? It, it depends on your point of view. You look at Title IX with uh, athletics in, in schools, and that changed everything. The women teams get as much money as the men teams to wherever it comes from, even if you know, they get 80% of their money from the football stadium. It still has to be split up between men and women's sports. Affirmative action, you know, it's, a, it's a legal thing. Okay, moving on to another topic. There is a company in Alameda that is working on a design, you are probably familiar with this, for a foiling container ship that is supposed to have a market niche that's somewhere between air freight and traditional shipping. What do you think of this idea of high-speed foiling container ships running transoceanic routes? It sounds great. We have, going back to the early 70s, Boeing built what was called a jet foil, and it had a hydraulic foil all the way across the transom, 
and it would slide down and, and then the boat would get up on the foil and there was a T foil on the bow and they'd run at 45 knots. To do that, it took a lot of power. So they had airplane engines, gas turbines. And they were very successful various places in the world. I used to take them in Japan from the train station to the airport and quite a remarkable machine, but the fuel cost got them compared to catamaran ferries came into being about that time. <clears throat> so the process works. There are a few ferries running in. We had one in Alameda, Harbor Bay Express 2 that ran to Alameda that was a foil boat. And the it, what it does is it lifts the hulls out of the water so there's less surface friction as compared to just the blunt trauma of going through the water. But the surface friction is about a two-thirds of the power requirement or maybe three-quarters on the container ship. So if you can lift it out of the water to any extent, you're going to save on surface friction. So it's a, but it seems like a big step to me. The container ships are now drawing when the ones in the harbor are drawing, I think they could get into 51 or 53 feet uh, dredging, and they're drawing 48 feet, 43, 48 feet. So to put something, an appendage down there to lift it, in port, it, port would be a problem. But a smaller container ship that's drawing 30 feet, which used to be a big, has some worthiness to me. The ship, container ships have the big ones in Oakland, or in the engines are in the 100,000 horsepower range. And uh, so if you could cut back on that, you're going to save fuel and fuel's money and fuel is CO2 and, and all the fossil fuel issues we have to deal with. So fuel economy might be an issue on this. So you're going to have to pay more for your freight once. Okay. The, the, foil, the foil will make the hull, the entire hull apparatus, more efficient to go through. The so once you're foiling, then your miles per gallon go up. Actually, it's gallons per mile. No, they so, Yeah, the gallons per mile goes down and the miles per gallon goes yes, up. Yes, significantly with ferry boats. Okay. And what comes up in my imagination is that I would hate to be a whale in the path of one of these things. This, this knife coming through the water at me at 45 knots and that if I'm a captain on one of these and I'm operating at night, which I would be at some times, that there are going to be things that there's all kinds of debris out there in the ocean. Why are these things not major concerns or are they major concerns and what's being done? Does the whale want blunt force trauma or does he want to slice up? Either way, it's a problem. And one of the, this woman that I worked for at the Weta Ferry, Mary Colmaine, she had us put up. It was called Far Sounder, and it was sonar on one of the hulls, the bow of one of the boats, to see the whales or a log floating in the water, whatever. And it was successful. We could, except there were no whales. And it was a real drag, not that it wouldn't work in one of the ship installations, but in the bay, it wasn't. We proved that it would work, but it was costing fuel and deemed unnecessary. So we went on with with the rest. Was that, it? that was a forward looking sonar? Yes. Or, okay. Yes. And it could, it was effective. It could see out there about 500 feet at 30 knots. So it was a sophisticated sonar, but it wasn't that expensive. It was about $70,000. Although at five, at 46 knots, you'll cover 500. That's thousand. right. I, I worked for three years on that. The Sea Fighter was the fastest ship in the Navy built up at where most of the ferries are built on Whidbey Island. And she mm -hmm. would do 45. Uh, we actually did 52 knots one day. And this thing's the size of a football field. And, I, and we went out and did night trials a couple of times. And I'll tell you, it was, and she didn't have that sonar. So it was shot in the dark, if you will. Yeah, I've worked on ferries where we operated at 30 knots and had infrared systems. And I'll tell you what, when there was, when the visibility was really down and we're basically operating on GPS, radar and infrared, we didn't find the infrared actually to be that helpful. And we knew this, this was after a heavy rainfalls and there were deadheads, logs that we knew were out there floating around. And you don't want to hit that with an alum aluminum hull 
at 30 knots. So that doesn't have a great ending. And but the answer to it is, well, slow down. But I, most, I, I, yeah, I, I wonder agree. about this out, out in the ocean. If you're, you're going thousands of miles and you're going at very high speeds, how you deal with this. Yeah, the, I was surprised. I'm still surprised. You mentioned that we have infrared on all the ferries now, I believe, or most of them. And, uh, and it's helpful, but not if you, you're going to hit a log, you're going to hit it. And it amazes me how little hull damage has occurred. With, I think there's 26 ferries working in the bay. And the Vallejo trip is the longest, and the logs are predominantly there. But the hull damage has been very slight. You would think it would be much worse, but it, they get them at an angle and bounce off. Yeah. This, I think creates a really great segue into another question that I have. And we were talking about this before we started the official interview here, but is the autonomous vessels and maybe something that's in between because the biggest challenge that I thought we saw on operating ferries was maintaining focus and attention. And neuroscientists are saying that people can stay focused for about three minutes at a time. And I know that the military's done research on this and they find that if a new radar observer comes on watch, that they will find more targets in the first 15 minutes of their watch than they will in the last 15 minutes of their watch consistently. So people can't maintain their attention that long. But with the, the coming of AI and this kind of thing, maybe coupled with radar, forward-looking sonars, infrared, and that kind of thing, it would enable human operators to work in, in an environment where you can work in high speeds and get the necessary warnings that you need. Are you seeing this kind of thing on the horizon? Have you seen these kinds of developments coming? First of all, marine field is extremely conservative in terms of adapting new technologies, even going from steam to diesel and, and diesel to automated diesel. I saw a ship a ship engine being built in Switzerland in 1980, 1990, and it, had, it didn't have direct fuel injection. It, it was hydraulically controlled by a computer. It took 10 years before they built a ship using that engine. Mm -hmm. And now they're all made that way. But if you think about, <clears throat> I went back and forth to Japan on some diesel tankers. I went to manage the tankers in Japan. I flew over there 65 times, roughly, round trip. And, and those ships that I was f flying on were autonomous vessels, basically. Mm. They leave San Francisco, they go to Osaka or Tokyo, and they don't even, they, they'll take off and land themselves. The technology's out there, but getting a Marine to take it on is another issue. So I don't know how soon they'll be here. There are some operating now in Rotterdam area and the East Coast, I think there's one. <clears throat> Excuse me, tugboats, they're coming. Yeah, and I can see where this could be a, a lot like what's happening with autonomous automobiles, where it starts off where it's running autonomously, but you have a human operator who can intervene. And that, then that eventually you build that trust level to where the human operator comes out of the loop entirely. Yeah, I think BART is probably like that too, or those kinds of systems. And if you'd asked me that question five years ago, before Tesla and others are making autonomous cars, self-driving cars, you, you'd think, no, that can't be, but it is. Yeah. I'm going to, uh, we're getting close to time on this. And so I'm going to move toward wrapping us up a little bit. This is a little bit, maybe a challenging question, but on some of these green technologies, like the use of biodiesel and others, there's energy input that has to be provided to create that biodiesel. And so you've got a sort of a energy return on energy invested equation. How do those things work out? I, I know that some of these vessels can consume a lot of fuel and bringing that down always a good thing, but it's easy to forget how much energy was required to you know, get the fuel into the vessel in the first time. So do you have any, or what comments do you have on that? If you think of biofuel, let's say 100% corn oil to make biofuel, if that's what we're talking about, you got you have to have the tractor to disc the field. You have to have the trucks to take it, pumps to pump it, and so forth. And I saw something just last week 
that said it was basically 20% of making a gallon of, let's say a gallon of biofuel, corn biofuel is, uh, so if you have a gallon of it, by the time it, it took you a 1.2 gallons, no, it took 0.2 gallons of energy worth to make that gallon. So there's a 20% penalty. And I've seen studies of people who really don't want us using biofuel that say, oh, it takes more energy to make it than you get out of it. And that's not true. You, you just think about if the tractor's using corn oil, running on corn oil, then it, it's a closed loop. And so you're getting clean oil. But the biofuel that you often see, often you'll see biofuel, this varies powered by biofuel. That's usually in the, it's called B or B10 at most, but it's 5% plant-based fuel and 95% fossil fuel. Because if you mix using bi, uh, biofuel, as it's called, if you use B100, 100%, there've been issues with other problems within the engine. And one of them is the creation of nitrous oxides. So NOx goes up 20%, 23%, something like that. But the, the renewable fuel that, that I mentioned several times is different than biofuel. And it's the plant, it take the, let's say corn oil or all kinds of different oils. And you take the oil and refine it like you would fossil fuel. And you get a product that'll run in any engine, any diesel engine will burn it quite nicely. That's where the shift is right now is tending like the city of San Francisco and Oakland, I believe, bus systems are using only renewable fuel and uh, water transit ferries are only renewable fuel. So that's clean stuff. The plant is making, well, the, the engine burns it and makes carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide. And then the plant, when it's growing, is making oxygen to offset that carbon dioxide. That, so that's how that works. And then the, the nitrous oxides are, are formed in the combustion process on the ferry boat engines or truck engines now have on ferry boats, it's called tier four or vessels, tier four, which means you use a, a product, a urea product to, and it's DEF. You see them at the gas station. Every diesel truck you see now has a blue cap next to the fuel tank. And there's a small tank for this urea that knocks down the NOx. So the nitrous oxide that's produced by the diesel engine is now, and automobile engines too, gasoline, to a smaller extent, is removed by that diesel engine death. So we're cleaning all that up, but we're still making carbon dioxide, which is known to be a greenhouse gas. That's a lot of words for, it's getting a lot cleaner. I used to, at my office when I was at Crowley was downtown San Francisco. And my view, I could see San Jose on a clear day, which was quite rare. Now you can see it every day. So there's been a tremendous improvement in the particulate part of the, the CO2 still going up, but the other pollutants are way, way down. Yeah. There's hope. And I, I remember that as well. I remember we used to have a lot more, and it was particulate smog than we do today. So big improvements there. So a, a couple of final questions that will tie us into the, the Sailing Science Center, if we can. How do you see sail power? being involved in commercial, I'm going to, I'm going to make this broad, in commercial maritime activities. How do you see that being involved in, as we go into the future? There are some ships being built and, and tour ships, tour vessels, let's say, being built with, with a rotate, rotating cylinder or two or four from, coming up from the deck of the ship, higher than the bridge. And, and unlike a sail like the Matthew Turner has 13 sails and a crew, minimum crew of five to, to man those sails or women those sails, I think they're called Schleppner rotors, and they are quite promising. The rotors, it doesn't look like it would work, but it does. So ships are being built. As the cost of fuel goes up, which it inevitably will as we get less and less of it, and offsets are required if you're burning fuel, That'll drive the cost up. So it's uh, it's coming, but it's a different form than a sail, if you will. Do you see that being used offshore or is that a technology with, 
it would be mostly restricted to inshore activities no, like ferries. No, these ships are offshore. Okay. Because I, we do have, I, I don't remember the name of it, but we do have a vessel and you'll know what it is that looks like that in the bay. I, it, I think it will work anywhere. Moving through the air, it spins and that generates some lift. It takes some power to spin it, but the what you get out of it is a lot more. It's like a sail on a sail. How did the America's Cup boats go 45 knots in 10 knots of wind? It is. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it's one of the most exciting things about sailing is that you can actually do that, that you can exceed the wind speed on an efficient sailboat. Yeah, and, and they use foils. And so you've reduced that frictional drag and the wave drag that, that slows you down. Okay, we're going to bring this to a close. And I just wanted to mention that in September of last year, which was 2021, Charlie, you did a, I guess you'd call it a podcast with the Italian Cultural Club of San Francisco, and it's a wonderful video with great slides in it. And we'll put a link at the end of this video for anybody who would like to see a little bit more of this kind of information. And then just mention that Charlie has his business. He says he's got all of the business that he needs, but his business is Walther Engineering. And just to open any final closing comments that you might have, Charlie, about green technology and how we be environmentally conscious and conscientious as we go into the future? I've turned from a tree pruner to a tree hugger, I guess. <laughs> it's very important. I have grandchildren and uh, we need to change what we've been doing. And, and my feeling is we're, it's not happening fast enough. So I do whatever I can to promote that. Yeah. And I think all of us really appreciate that. And we can see how important this is. And I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to us today and being a part of the Sailing Science Center podcast series. And we will look forward to seeing Green Marine on the water. And that's the end of this episode of the Sailing Science Center podcast. The Sailing Science Center podcast is a production of the San Francisco Sailing Science Center. The interview was conducted by Jim Hancock. Production and editing was performed by Charlie Dice. Thank you for listening.